This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Jewish refugees fleeing the war in Ukraine become new immigrants to Israel. And the Abraham Accords gain ground in the Middle East. Plus, from the Garden Tomb to the Sea of Galilee and the Mount of Olives, He is risen indeed. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. More than four and a half million people have fled Ukraine since Russia invaded in February. Among them, thousands of Jewish people hoping to make a new home in Israel. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl traveled to Moldova to see how one organization is teaming up with officials to bring the Jewish people home to Israel. Ukrainians forced to flee their homes because of war. Some of them Holocaust survivors and others fleeing for a second time. You can imagine the atmosphere, nervous tension and an unpredictable destiny. What can one expect other than being murdered? Almost all the buildings around us burned down. It was a miracle that our building didn't burn. When a mortar hits a building, it starts a fire and there are no means to extinguish it. There is no water in the city. While a nightmare for many fleeing Ukrainians, these Jewish refugees have a unique hope for the future. When the Jewish community waiting for people there and there's buses and they know we're going to leave and they know that Israel is helping them to come, it's like, if already to be a refugee, it's better to be a Jewish refugee. The Israeli government and Jewish organizations are banding together to make it possible. Alona Grosu of the Jewish community of Moldova says when they heard about the war, they knew the world would never be the same. So from this day, we've um, started organizing a rescue operation for the members of uh, Jewish communities from Ukraine. Until a few weeks ago, this was a tennis center in Kishinev, Moldova. That changed overnight when Russia invaded Ukraine. The municipality opened the center for fleeing refugees and the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, along with the local Jewish community, stepped in to help. Here, with the Jewish community, with the joint, with all the organization, we built an opportunity to have places for the people to sleep, to eat, to be in a safe, warm place. More than 10,000 eligible Ukrainians have immigrated to Israel since the war began. They are fleeing Ukraine through Poland, Hungary, Romania, and about a third have escaped through Moldova. From the border of Moldova, these refugees are taken either to the Israeli consulate or the Hub Tennis Center, where the Jewish agency determines their eligibility to immigrate to Israel. The foreign ministry provides them with documents, and the IFCJ books them on charter flights. That's where CBN News met Ludmila Polunova, her mother, Tetiana, and 16-year-old son, Andre. It's a catastrophe. It was a miracle that we were able to leave Mariupol now. On March 12th, an aircraft bomb fell next to our house. All the windows, glass, window frames and doors were shattered in the apartment. It was freezing outside and it was impossible to stay in the apartment. Ludmilla and her family lived in the basement for a week. We are thankful to the neighbors. We survived because of them. We left thanks to my son. We found out that in the nine-story building next door, there was a phone reception on the ninth floor. My son remembered that his classmate lived in the neighboring town of Mangush and her father owned a minibus. My son ran to the ninth floor, called her, and her father took us out the very next day. It wasn't the first time this family had to escape. They fled the Donetsk region in 2014. This time they have a different outlook. We expect peace. We expect some kind of well-being, a peaceful life. We were kicked out of Donetsk, kicked out of Mariupol, and now I simply don't know what to do. I want a future for my son. I hope everything will go well in Israel, that this whole thing will be over. It's hard to move, of course. All my friends are in Ukraine. But at least there will be peace in Israel. I think Israel is our salvation, and I think everything will go well for us. The main thing is for us to be healthy, to be alive, because we couldn't even hope that everything would end so well. Until their departure, refugees are housed at places like this guest house outside Kishinev. Holocaust survivor Zinovi Lekarev came here after he turned 86 on March 16th. I didn't have a birthday. There was bombing and shelling. That's why I was at home. Two rocket explosions happened about 50 to 60 meters from our house. We were at home. These were frightful explosions. Everything shook. The entire nine-story building was shaking. That's when I decided to leave. It brought back scary memories. 
In September 1941, under bombing and shelling of the trains we were in, we left the city. We returned to Kharkiv in March of 1944. And 78 years later, with just a plastic bag in hand, Zinovi was on the run again. But this time he has two daughters, two granddaughters, and a great-granddaughter waiting for him in Israel. I'm very happy that I'm finally going to leave this hell, but it's very unpleasant and heavy for me. When the hotels and guest houses were full, they opened this warehouse where we met Vera Chimran. She also recalled her first time having to leave everything behind. My first evacuation took place 81 years ago in 1941. I remember a freight car. There was a transit camp like this, only this one is comfortable. Back then, the only thing we had was a blanket. Vera returned to Kharkiv after World War II and stayed put until now. What can I say? I feel more cheerful. I'm able to move again. Before, I stopped moving. I had COVID with bad complications. My leg was paralyzed. I couldn't even imagine that I'd travel such distances as I didn't leave the house for half a year. So far, the IFCJ has helped more than 2,200 refugees fly to Israel from Moldova since the war started. But this time, it's not a regular aliyah. It's saving life. And saving the souls. Benny Haddad says they usually have a chance to prepare new immigrants before they come. Now it's a short time. You're touching the people for two seconds. They're coming here, they want as much as faster to be there because they live as refugees here without anything. And the main goal is to send them to Israel and save them from here. Here at the Kishinev airport, these people behind me are no longer Ukrainian refugees. Within a few hours, they'll be citizens of Israel, fulfilling biblical prophecy. Zinovi and Ludmila, Tetiana and Andre were among 112 new immigrants and nine pets. CBN News joined on the three-hour flight back to Israel. And then they were home. We don't comprehend it yet. We're happy. Thank God there's no shooting, no shooting. I hope I'll never hear it again. At my age, it's a new beginning. I don't know how to explain this. At this age, people hang up their fiddle completely, but I decided to change everything from the start. This is the first day of their new adventure as Israelis. It may not be easy here, but they'll be planted in the land of their forefathers and should never have to run away again. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Kishinev, Moldova, and Tel Aviv, Israel. Coming up, the historic Abraham Accords gain ground and acceptance in the Middle East. To many international leaders and Mideast observers, the Abraham Accords seemed impossible just a few years ago. But the historic peace agreements are gaining more acceptance and regional support. This group of international diplomats are getting an up-close look at Jerusalem's Western Wall and Temple Mount. Former Israeli ambassador to the UN, Danny Danone, brought them here after spending several days in the UAE in Bahrain. We are all very proud of the Abraham Accord that was signed by President Trump, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and leaders from the Gulf. Today, we see the fruits of those agreements. We took a delegation of uh, senior diplomats, including the vice president of uh, Paraguay, minister of foreign affairs, for an eight days trip to the UAE, Bahrain, and Israel. We feel that it's an important accord, but we can do much more with other countries. And the goal of this trip is to show the world the potential of the work between Israel and moderate Arab countries. Paraguay's vice president felt the trip provided deep meaning for him. Being in the Holy Land is always important for every Christian, and so is the legacy that Danny Danone is passing on to us we see that it's possible to have peace between human beings. The likely renewal of the Iranian nuclear deal, plus the regime's threat to Israel and the Gulf states, cast a shadow over the visit and the region. A Bulgarian ambassador sees the region separated into two camps, one of war and one of peace. I never came here to Jerusalem on a flight from Arabic country. Yesterday I did that. What I think will happen in the future is that the initial interaction between Israel and the Arabic countries, human-to-human -human interaction, uh, cultural interaction, uh, tourism, I'm sure will go farther to the next stage where uh, Israel and the Arabic countries will cooperate in the field of security, international security, and will reinforce the camp of peace. 
For this Croatian ambassador, the trip expanded her view of the regional accords. This trip gave me the opportunity to learn about um, uh, Emirati and Bahrain perspective of the Abraham Accords. And after this visit, I believe that there is a same level, the highest level of dedication uh, for um, all three sides for peace, prosperity and uh, stability in the region that, uh, and even uh, wider than that. The trip also opened up new opportunities. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Central African Republic, she signed diplomatic relations with Bahrain during the visit. The Vice President of Paraguay announced that they will open an embassy in the UAE. So we see the fruits of the accords and I believe that we will be able to do much more, not only here and in the region, but worldwide. In addition, also, it gave me opportunity to see and to explore the possibilities of uh, joining to this uh, ambitious project. I am certain that there is a wider possibility for the countries like Croatia to join in certain niche and cooperation and to contribute to the project and also to contribute to my country. It makes a difference for uh, everyone, this is my impression, and it can also make specific impact for countries like Croatia. They were amazed because for years, and I know it from the UN, when you say Israel, the Middle East, you think about a conflict. And all of a sudden they came to the Middle East and they saw solutions. They saw that we can actually help them to resolve conflicts. We can help them to improve the lives of their citizens in terms of food security, health, agriculture. Up next, walking in Jesus' footsteps from the resurrection to the ascension. Resurrection Day. From the garden tomb to the Sea of Galilee to the Mount of Olives. Walking where Jesus walked from his resurrection to his ascension. Take a look at a story we did for Easter on CBN's family app. Happy Easter and Resurrection Day. I'm here in the garden tomb in the heart of Jerusalem, where many people believe Jesus was buried and then rose from the dead. This is how Matthew in his gospel describes the amazing, world-shaking, and eternity-changing morning 2,000 years ago. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven he came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he is risen as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So after the resurrection, Jesus came somewhere here on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. This is how John in his gospel describes what happened. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, 
it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. The last time Jesus showed himself to his disciples was here in the Mount of Olives. The book of Acts tells about that last encounter with the King of Kings. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And that promise is echoed in the book of Revelation with the words, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Coming up, following God's command to make and eat matzah for more than 3,000 years. Every year, Jewish people around the world celebrate the exodus from Egypt with the Passover Seder. One of the key elements is unleavened bread or matzah. And if a whole country eats matzah for a week, that's a lot of matzah. Take a look at how it's made here in Israel. The Bible calls it the bread of affliction, unleavened bread or matzah. Every year, the Jewish people are commanded to retell the story of their exodus from Egypt and to eat unleavened bread for seven days. Because the Lord made them live very fast, they had to make uh, bread that didn't have time to rise and uh, they, they ate this, this flat bread, which is matzah. Most Israelis take the commandment to eat unleavened bread very seriously, and many actually like it. Grocery stores like this one devote whole sections to it. And besides regular matzah, you can get egg, whole wheat, and even choco matzah. The regular matzah must be made of flour and water only. The flour would look to you and at like a regular flour, but it's not regular flour. Roy Wolf is vice president of Matzot Aviv, he told CBN News the whole process, from mixing to rolling to shaping to baking, must be finished in 18 minutes, because the moment water touches the flour, it starts rising. In reality, our process is much, much faster. We want to be as efficient as possible, and the whole process takes no longer than three, four minutes. But every 15 minutes, in order to avoid uh, to have any leftovers of uh, leavened dough, we have to clean the mixer system. Wolf is the sixth generation to work in his family's business, which started in 1887. They've been in the current factory since 1946. In the basements here where we have the flower silos today, the Haganah, the first defense forces, used to hide the weapons from the British uh, mandate. Since 1946, we've been here making matzah. Uh, of course, the, the, the factory was refurbished several times. At Matzot Aviv, they make about 20 tons of matzah per day. They start in October and work around the clock for the last month, except on the Sabbath, to provide matzah to Jewish communities in Israel and around the world. We are exporting uh, to over 35 countries, to all Jewish communities uh, around, the, uh, around the world. 
from the large communities in North America to even the smallest community. There's one person that's in Wallis Island. He's the doctor of the island, and we are sending him matzah every year. And so he will, have, he will be able to have a, a seder with, <laughs> with matzah from Israel. But we also have Christian communities buying matzah in countries like Korea and Singapore, where it's, uh, I, I, the, uh, I've been told that in some churches it's been used as the, the holy bread. The Last Supper would have been a Passover seder with unleavened bread. Because of that, many Christians like to take communion with matzah. Some even say that the design of the matzah, striped and pierced, is symbolic of the Messiah himself. You might think with all this matzah making that the Wolf family would get tired of Passover, but not so. We're waiting for the seder. We usually come very tired to the seder because I'm working until the, the same day in the afternoon. But it means a lot. This holiday, of course, means a lot to us. One Israeli compared matzah to a data drive passing along information from generation to generation. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. To all of our Jewish friends, we wish you Pesach Sameach, Happy Passover. And for our Christian friends, we say Happy Resurrection Day. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.